continue with our series on the cross. We have looked at the preaching of the cross. We've looked at uh, the greatness of the cross. We've looked at the justification of the cross. When we believe and receive Jesus Christ as our Savior, the Bible says we are justified. We are declared righteous in the sight of God through what Christ has done for us for us on the cross. But this morning we're going to look at the reality of the cross, the truth of it, the certainty of it from Romans 5, Amen. verses 6 uh, through 11. I'll get there in a minute. There we are. We're going to start kind of in the middle of verse 5. And the word of the Lord reads, Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which is given unto us, for when we were yet without strength, in due time, at just the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man would one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commended or demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Christ. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. And not only so, but we also joy in God. But we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement or the reconciliation. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Amen? Amen. The central theme of the New Testament is the cross of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus. The cross is the passion of the gospel. The resurrection is the power of the gospel. But over and over and over in the New Testament do we see the reality of the cross confirmed. Over and over and over you find the truth and the certainty of the cross of Jesus Christ. But what many people may not realize is, is even secular history confirms the reality of the cross. Let's say we do away with the, old, or the New Testament, the gospel. What does the secular accounts from first century, second century have to say about that? Well, in the 1974 edition of the Encyclopedia Burkhanan, Ber 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 Say it. Britannica. Thank you. The writer, writing about Jesus Christ, uses 20,000 words to describe him. More space given to Jesus than Aristotle, Cicero, Alexander, Julius Caesar, Caesar Buddha, Confucius, Mohammed, or Napoleon Bonaparte. Concerning the testimony of many independent secular accounts of Jesus of Nazareth, the author resoundingly concludes... These independent accounts, extra-biblical stuff, has nothing to do with the Bible, prove that in ancient times even the opponents of Christianity never doubted the historicity of Jesus. Jesus Christ was a man and a fact and a truth in history. Amen? Yes. And do you know that you can go back and study the records and the records show that Jesus was a Jewish man? And that he did all kinds of miracles. And the word that they attached to him in these secular accounts was, is he did miracles through sorcery, if you will. It also says that the religious leaders, the Jewish people, were against Jesus. It says that the Romans crucified Jesus. And then after his crucifixion, his believers and followers believed that he was alive and they worshipped him as God. So much so that these believers spread all over Asia Minor, even as far away as Rome, worshiping Jesus Christ as God. Hallelujah. Yes. The reality of the cross, folks, is real. That's right. It is undisputed. You, now, you may say, well, I don't believe it, but if you believe any facts of history, you have to believe in the reality of the cross. There is so much evidence of the reality of the cross. And if the cross is true, and it is, there are some other things that are true as well. And we need to embrace that reality. Amen? Amen. Amen. So this morning we're going to look at the reality of the cross. And it reveals several things. First, it reveals what I'm going to call 
Man's helplessness. Say that with me. Reveals man's helplessness. In verse 6, Paul says, For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for us. Who are the we here in this text? That would be those who uh, have been saved, but before they were saved, Paul is saying, before we were saved, we were yet without strength. In the Greek text, the words without strength is in one, is one word. And it means powerless. It means without ability. It means without strength in a spiritual sense. And this is translated in many different ways. The NIV has it when we were still powerless. While we were still helpless in the New American Standard says. Amplified, while we were yet in weakness, powerless to help ourselves. Well, what is this power, powerlessness and this helplessness in regard to? Our sin problem before God. That's what it's in regard to. We were powerless, we were helpless to do anything about our sin problem before God so that God could forgive us and accept us into His kingdom. We were without any power, any ability to do anything about our sin problem and the debt that we owe God for breaking His law. The cross stands on history to remind us that the cross reveals my helplessness before God when it comes to my sin problem and yours as well. This is the argument that Paul has been making in chapter 3. He says in chapter 3 and verse 10, there is none righteous, no, not one. In verse 23, he says again, for all have sinned and come short of what God demands and expects. The righteous demands of the law, we are not able to keep those. We have broken His law. We've all come short of what God demands and expects. In chapter 4, He tells us that no one can be justified by their works or doing good deeds in verses 1 through 8. In verses 9 through 12, He tells us that no one can be justified before God by keeping the ordinances. And then in verses 13 through 15, He tells us that no one can be justified before God by keeping the law because no one can keep the law. And so the cross is a reminder. The reality of the cross reminds us and reveals to us man's helplessness when it comes to our sin problem. We can't do anything about that. In In uh, our discipleship series that we use with new Christians, I don't know if you can see that or not, in the very first lesson, it says to read Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. And then it asks this question, why do human efforts always fail to reach God? Mm -hmm. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 says, for by grace are you saved through faith. It is a gift of God and not of works, lest any man should boast. Why do human efforts always fail to reach God? According to that verse, salvation is by grace through faith. Number two, it is a gift of God. And number three, it's not by works lest any man should boast. Very simply, human efforts can never reach God. Human efforts can, ne human efforts can never justify us before God. You see in that picture an illustration, an image of a uh, a man there who is a sinful man and he's under the sentence of a spiritual death and he's trying to get over to a holy God in eternal life. He can't get there. His good works, he comes up short. He's trying to get there by religion. You can join any church you want to. You can join any religion you want to. You can't get there by religion. Religion, religion is a system of man-made works whereby man is trying to work himself to heaven. It cannot be done. Other people say, well, I'm a pretty good person. My morality. The Bible says there is none righteous. No, not one. We do not stand up to the standard that God has set for us. We all come short of that. So no man can get over there. Only by faith in Jesus Christ can we get there. Amen? Amen. The cross reveals man's sinfulness. More importantly, the cross reveals my sinfulness before God. 
Now, just for a moment, hypothetically, let's pretend or say hypothetically that this man in this image for good works can give himself over to a holy God in eternal life. Just pretend. And let's just draw us an imaginary line right over there on good works and he's able to get across there. What would that mean if one person could do that? What would that mean? If one person could do it, who else could do it? Anybody who wanted to put out the effort. If one person could get there by good works, that means that other people can get there. It also means that the cross is unnecessary. And that God made a tremendous mistake in sending Jesus Christ mm -hmm. to be our Savior. But you see, God didn't make a mistake. Mm -hmm. And the cross is absolutely necessary. The cross reminds us of man's helplessness. I can't do anything of my own to merit salvation. I can't please God. I can't work my way to heaven. There is no good that I can do. <laughs> The cross reminds us of that. Amen? Amen? So the reality of the cross reminds us of man's sinfulness. Next. But it also re reminds us and reveals God's love. Verses 7 and 8. Look along with me. For scarcely for a righteous man would one die, yet perhaps for a good man some would even dare to die. But God demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The word love in verse 8 in the Greek is agape. And it is defined in the word study as the divine supernatural love of the supreme being for entirely unworthy objects. Amen? This text is telling us we are the unworthy objects, by the way. Your text says sinners. That literally reads in the Greek text, enemies of God. And it says that while we were enemies, Christ died for us. Christ demonstrated his love for us while we were rejecting him and were his enemies. Now here's something very important that I don't want you to miss. Jesus himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree. That's what Paul is telling us. Peter says, Jesus himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree. Now, I want you to look at verse 7 with me again. And notice something here. I don't, I don't want you to miss this point. It's very easy to read right over this and miss this. For scarcely or rarely would a righteous man, for a righteous man will one die. Yet, perhaps, for a good man, would some even dare to die. What Paul is saying is, is you know, people are not in the habit of dying for each other. How many of you died for lately? Well, nobody, because you're still here. Amen. <laughs> He's making this argument. If you were going to die for somebody, what kind of person would that person have to be for you to give your life for? Paul says it's a rare thing for somebody to be willing to die for a righteous man. It's a rare thing for somebody to be willing to die, even dare to die, for a good man. So we're talking about righteous people and good people for which one would dare to even die. Verse 8. But God demonstrated his own love toward us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. What Paul is telling us that God let his son die not for a bunch of righteous people, God let his son die not for a bunch of good people, but he let his son die for the worst of the worst, literally enemies of God. <coughs> Do you see that? Yes, sir. The kind of person that would raise their fist to heaven and curse God. The kind of person who would say, I don't believe God exists. I don't believe in his word. I don't believe anything about that. The kind of people that he mentions in Romans chapter 1 and 2, the vilest of the vile, those who had no fear of God before God's eyes. God demonstrated his love for even people like that. Jesus didn't come to die for a bunch of good people <coughs> and a bunch of righteous people. He came to die for the worst of the worst sinners. The worst of the worst 
The reality of the cross reveals God's love for us. And that should motivate us as His children to worship Him, praise Him, and be willing to serve Him. Amen? Amen. In the parables in Luke 15, I read one of them this morning, the lost sheep. And it's a parable of a person who's got 99 sheep. He leaves the 99 and he goes after the one. And he finds the one. He puts it upon his shoulder, shoulders and takes it home. And then when he gets there, he rejoices with his neighbors. For his sheep was lost and now it's found. And then Jesus says this, that heaven rejoices over one sinner. Over one sinner that repents. This reveals the quality of God's love for us. He leaves the 99 and goes after the one. Why? Because they're lost. They need help. He doesn't hold back. He doesn't look in the 99 and say, man, I got 99. What do I care about the one? That's God's heart. You and I can't think that way. You and I can't love that way because we're not God. We can't even get our hands around that. Because we would see all that we do have rather than the one that slipped away. This is a picture of the quality, the depth, and the power of God's love. In the lost coin, the lady has ten coins. She loses one of them. She lights a candle and puts it up where she can see. She sweeps and cleans her house until she finds it. And when she finds it, she calls her neighbors in. Say, come rejoice with me because my lost coin is found. And again, Jesus says, all heaven will rejoice when one sinner repents turns to me. Amen. Think of that. Only one in heaven rejoices <coughs> and one person who gets right with God. Then in the last story, we call it the prodigal son who demands his inheritance early. His father gives it to him and he goes out and he wastes his inheritance in riotous living. Throws it away. Winds up working on a pig farm. Now he's a Jewish boy and you know how they feel about pigs. <laughs> Even eating pig food to get by on it. He finally comes to himself says, I've sinned against God. I've sinned against my father. My father's got a place. I'm going to go home. And so he goes home. And when his father sees him coming a great way off. What do you think that this father would do after his son has left him high and dry, taken his inheritance and wasted it? What do you think that most of us would do? We'd stand back like this. We'd let him come home. We'd be glad he's home. But you know what most of us would do? Well, we're going to hold back a little bit to see if he's going to work out or not. <laughs> I'm not going to put my heart out there again to get it broken and stepped all over and mashed and hurt. Amen. You know what I'm saying? But the Bible tells a very different story. It says when that father saw his son coming, that he ran to him and fell upon his neck and wept and kissed him and rejoiced. He put a ring on his finger. He put shoes on his feet. He put a robe on his back. And he said, kill the fatted calf. We're going to celebrate. We're going to party because my son who was dead is now alive. My son who was lost is now found. Amen. He didn't hold back. Praise God. He put himself out there. He risked everything. He would be, in many people's estimation, reckless in the way that he loved his son and forgave his son. This is a picture of the heart of God for us. He doesn't measure out his love to us. He gives it all in Jesus Christ. The reality of the cross reveals God's love. You can even call it reckless if you want to. Because He comes after us. He goes up every hill. He goes to the deepest depth. He goes to all lengths to reach us with a message of the gospel and about how much God loves us. And He wants heaven with us in it. Amen? Amen. Amen. The reality of the cross reveals man's helplessness. It reveals God's love. But it also reveals this. 
It reveals sin's judgment. Say that with me. It reveals sin's judgment. Listen to verses 9 through 11. Much more than being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom, by whom we have now received the atonement. The cross reveals that sin has been judged. And God's justice and punishment on sin has been satisfied. That's what that cross means. It means many things, but that's one of the things that you and I need to get in our head and understand this. The righteous demands of the law demanded punishment for breaking the law. It demanded justice. The Bible tells us that every sin, every transgression, and every disobedience receives a just reward. God's very nature, listen to me now, God's very nature demands justice when we break His law. His righteousness, His holiness, His godness demands that sin be paid for. That justice be meted out. What kind of God would God be if He let all of this sin go and never dealt with it? What kind of sheriff would we have down here in Benel if He looked every other way, let people uh, break laws, hurt people, do all kinds of crimes and never did anything about it. Well, he would be a good for nothing sheriff. That's what he'd be. God cannot let all of this go. For God to maintain his godness and his authority, sin must be paid for, must be judged. His nature demands that sin be paid for and justice be given. Amen? Amen. Listen to this. You say, well, how in the world is God going to do that? Heaven is a righteous and a holy place. That's where God lives. Now, how in the world is God going to let a bunch of sinners like us, a bunch of enemies, as it says in the text, who have broken God's law over and over, how is God going to let us into heaven? How is He going to fellowship with us? How is that possible and for Him to maintain His godness and His authority? How is He going to do that? Just like this right here. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For God made Christ who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the what? <coughs> the righteousness of God in Him. <coughs> Only God is smart enough to figure that out. Only God is smart enough to figure out a way for my sin to be judged and paid for it and allow me to go to heaven. And this is the way He did it. He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, who knew no sin, committed no sin, to go to the cross and be a substitute and a sacrifice for humanity. Praise His holy name. Amen. That is how God can forgive us and receive us into His heaven. Now, with that said, I want you to look at verse 9, verse 10, and 11. Every single one of those verses, every single one of those verses... Confirm sin's judgment. Look in verse 9. Much more then, being now justified by His blood, we shall be what? Saved. Saved from wrath through Him. The wrath of God is on us as a lost person because we've broken God's law. John chapter 3 and verse 36 says that apart from Christ, the, the wrath of God abides on us. But when you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, you open your heart and you turn from your sin and yourself and place your faith and trust in Jesus, the Bible declares that you are forgiven and that you are declared righteous and justified by His blood. We shall be saved from wrath through Him. Jesus took my punishment and my hell on that cross. Hallelujah. Verse 9 stands on the pages of Scripture, says that sin has been judged totally and completely. Verse 10 says, For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son. The word reconciled means that we have, been, we have made peace with God. 
See, before we were enemies of God. But when you receive Christ as your Savior, you're a child of God. You make peace with Him. Romans 5, 1 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have what? Peace with God. We are forgiven. Again, another verse telling us that sin has been judged. Verse 11. Not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. King James used the word atonement. Break that word down. At one minute. That's what it means. To become one with God. To be forgiven. Literally means to be reconciled. Through what Christ has done for us, we have now received the reconciliation. We have peace with God. Every single one of these verses tell us that sin has been judged totally and completely, which means that I can be forgiven for my sin. Amen? Amen. The cross, the shadow of the cross, or not the shadow of the cross, but the reality uh, of the cross reveals sin's total and complete judgment. You say, are you sure, Pastor? I am very sure. Amen. Jesus himself said it. That banner is hanging on the wall. These are the seven last sayings of Jesus on the cross. You see the one, the last one toward the bottom of the white. After Jesus had experienced punishment and the justice of God for paying our sin debt, he died. From 12 o'clock to 3 o'clock, the Bible tells us that the sun went out. Wouldn't even look upon what was going, upon, going on on the cross. God turned away and looked away and left Jesus there to die alone as he became the sin bearer for the world. Even the sun refused to shine. And at the end of that time, Jesus said, It is finished. The word finished is in the Greek text is an accounting word that means the debt has been reconciled. <laughs> I like that. The debt is paid in full. Jesus accomplished his goal. The fire wrath of God burned itself out <coughs> on Jesus Christ as he took my punishment and my hell and yours as well said it is finished. The goal is done. David's account has been reconciled. It's free. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. God. I was sharing one time with a guy, witnessing to him and sharing about the cross and how that Jesus died for us and because Jesus died for us and rose for us, he is the only way to heaven. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man goeth to heaven but by me. Amen? Amen. And I was sharing with this guy about the cross and how Jesus said it is finished and that he died for us and he paid our sin debt. And that old boy said the strangest thing to me. This is what he said. He said, you mean to tell me that God put all of his eggs in one basket on Jesus? And I said, yeah, he did. You know what he said? He said, I'd never do that. He said, I always have a contingency plan. He said, that was unwise. And what he was saying is that was reckless. But you know what? That old boy ain't God, is he? And that is exactly what God did. He put all of his eggs in one basket. Jesus died for our sins and rose again for our justification. And if we put our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ, he will forgive us. Amen? Amen. 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 This is the certainty, the truth, and the reality of the cross. Amen. It reveals man's helplessness to do anything about his sin problem. It reveals the demonstration of God's love and how much he loves us in Christ Jesus. And it also reveals the reason that God can forgive us as a bunch of sinners. Jesus took my place on that cross. Praise God. Man, I'll be glad when we get done here. <laughs> Did you turn your Bluetooth off? I'm not even moving. But you have heard the word. Are you ready to meet the Lord in eternity? Because everybody's going to meet him sometime or another. That's right. 
And you need Jesus if you haven't met him. Now, we're not going to take you against your will. If you don't want to receive Jesus, you don't have to. But I want to tell you what. God will spare no expense in revealing to you that he loves you. He is reckless in that. He will come after you. He'll give you dreams. He'll give you friends. He'll give you songs. He'll give you the gospel in many different ways. He will let you know that he loves you. Amen. Will you let him find you today? Will you come to him and humble yourself and receive Christ as your Savior? Amen? Amen. 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 Let's bow before the Lord.